And um, I think that, you know, the encounter with another mind that you make in a book is a fantastic instruction in attentiveness, you know, in the possibility of seeing things otherwise than you would see them. Um, I, I think that, you know, we individually can counter mass pressures, cultural pressures, marketing pressures, by remembering things like the absolute importance of being able to enjoy being alone, being able to enjoy quiet or silence, uh, being able to want to think a thought all the way from beginning to the, the beginning to the end. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the books to have. Books really saved my life. Marilyn Robinson is a novelist, academic, and essayist with work that includes the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, novel Gilead and her brand new collection of essays, What Are We Doing Here? She writes with a beautiful economy and she commands her readers' attention. You show up to read Marilyn Robinson. Her writing has on many occasions quite literally taken my breath away. Reading her, you all at once feel her enormous generosity, her gifts of her faith, her intellectual curiosity, and the rigor she brings to her work. Her writing, whether her novels or her nonfiction, have always felt urgent and necessary, but I am so grateful to have the work of Marilyn Robinson right now, and I'm sure you do too. So please help me welcome her to the stage. Uh, thank you again, Marilyn. It's such a pleasure to talk with you and have you here well, in Toronto. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Um, as I was preparing for this and, and reading the new book um, and doing sort of reading back interviews with you, um, it was in the aftermath of the shootings in Parkland, Florida. And I was struck about, you know, the way that you've talked about fear and the American psyche. And it felt quite profound to be, you know, reading your work and thinking about your writing at a time when the, the discussion over guns and violence and, and, and how, do, how do we create a safe uh, culture and a safe world was happening. Um, and you've talked about how fear has become central to American life, that there is this fear of the other, fear of difference, fear of, fear of losing what we have, and yet the American project and the idea of America has long been one of optimism, of boldness. Um, can you talk about this current state that America finds itself in in regards to this sense of fear and anxiety? Well, I would say, first of all, that this is not characteristic of the country at large. It's characteristic of a loud and momentarily influential minority of people. Um, when you look at you know, indicators of public opinion, like how many people want to ban you know, these terrible weapons or how many people uh, are offended by the laws that, that allow these things to happen. Um, they're very large majorities of the American public. Um, something has gone very strangely wrong. I, I, it will take historians to figure it out. But uh, the, the majority, even the overwhelming majority, can be basically pushed aside by certain interests that have found a way to have an extraordinary influence in the government, in the Congress, in, in state governments also in many cases. So uh, and they are people who talk all the time about fear, about threat, about dread. They seem to think that there's something um, admirable, you know, as if to act frightened all the time were a sign of courage. Um, and I don't, I think most people actually sort of thought this was some passing thing that was just too bizarre to last or to really penetrate the culture. And that was wrong. It has lasted and it has penetrated. And um, it has to be taken on as a problem of that scale. One of the things I think is, is that people who, for example, have a, a, an economic interest in selling weapons and so on, or people of certain kinds of extreme political views have learned how to kind of commodify fear, make it a saleable item. They've done this through, through media, 
you know, through their own media. Um, and that's a novel problem. It's nothing that we've ever quite looked at before. Mm. Is it different than, you know, obviously there have been other moments of kind of a mass anxiety. I think about the Cold War, for instance. Um, is there something different at play here then, or are there solutions to be found in looking at, uh, looking at past moments like this, when there was this sense of fear, this sense of uh, retreat, uh, and, and moments of, feel, of isolating um, uh, the nation from the world? Um, is there something to be learned from those previous experiences um, in American life? I think that, I mean, you know, the poor old human species has had to observe the fact that the wretched old human species has indeed created weapons uh, mm. qualitatively different from anything that has ever been dealt with before. That is the m missiles, the nuclear problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's surprising that, that people had a sense of anxiety that was uh, I mean, it was a new situation then. People had no idea whether anything would be found to, to you know, ameliorate or modify the situation. Um, but that was the idea. That was the sense of a foreign threat, basically. Whereas in this um, situation, the people that are the problem, in my opinion, well, they are the problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have succeeded in persuading themselves that uh, a large part of the, the American population is the enemy. And that's a big change. That's a mm. big difference. Mm. And a much more um, difficult one for people to deal with, I think. Yeah. In the, I think it was in the final essay in the book, you talk about um, this question of you know, fear in a more personal way, about um, you know, sort of having a, a kind of um, finding a, a, a equilibrium in your relationship with your mother, um, and then she discovered Fox News, you write. <laughs> and, and she gets very caught up in the kind of the scaremongering, the, the war on Christmas, the, the kind of us versus them. Um, and so I just thought of it when you, when you talked about the idea of the, what's different now is the idea of um, this fear that's getting whipped up of, of Americans fearing one another. And I think when it plays out within families as well, how do we deal with this neighbor to neighbor, citizen to citizen, but then also within our own family when there are these differences in worldviews? It's a very painful problem. I, I was thinking about that because really a surprising number of people have said to me, I dread Thanksgiving. You know, I, I haven't seen my mother in six months because we always have a nasty fight, that sort of thing people say to me. So I thought, well, I know what they're talking about. I wrote that essay. My mother was, God rest her, the most private person in the world. And here I've written about her. Not in the most positive terms, I, I admit. I, when I had written the essay, I sent it to my brother, and I said, should I publish this? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, it's a, I, there are some things that I really, I feel as though I should bring to the fore. And one of them is that these uh, lines that have been drawn uh, in American life often run right through families and create really lamentable conflicts and antagonisms in, within, within the group of people that for most people are most important, most precious, you know? Um, so I, I published the essay about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and it's interesting, did you, it's because when your brother said no, have you spoken about it since? Did he just accept that you're a writer and a writer's going to put her work out in the world? And that really, I was really asking him. I don't have any of this writer puts her work out in the world ethic. I, I'm very selective about what I put out in the world. Um, but uh, I told him, I asked him, he told, wrote back and said, don't. And then after about a week and a half, he wrote back and said, do. <laughs> <laughs> He's my big brother, you know. I <laughs> um, you, uh, you also write in an essay about um, conscience. 
Um, you say, I believe in the reality of conscience, having observed it in myself and others. I'm a little surprised to find it disappearing before me as I write. <laughs> um, when did you notice this sense of, this broader sense of, of, the, of the notion of one's conscience or conscientiousness disappearing? What were you picking up on? What, what, were, you, what were you seeing around you? Well, you know, we live in a very complex environment. There's what people actually feel and act on, and then there's all this talk about how the human psyche is constructed and so on. I find that these things tend not to resemble each other very much, which never disheartens the people that are writing about the human psyche. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, you can read theorists who say there, in effect, is no human self. This is not, this, um, not a virus that escaped the, lab the laboratory. This is something that you hear people talk about and write things on the assumption of and so on. Um, and one of them is that well, the idea that people are radically self-interested can't help, you know, genetically self-interested. The other being that they are socially constructed, that there's no self there except whatever their um, the ambient society happens to have put together in their particular case. And so the, the very highly individual uh, experience of conscience, you know, which you know, has often singled people out heroically over against societies that are going wrong and so on. Um, the, the thing that, that at least in, in uh, major portions of religious culture in the United States has been the, the identification of the essential self. It has been where, this, where God meets the soul is in the conscience, you know? Um, and so, I mean, I was brought up actually to take my conscience very seriously, to believe that when it was telling me something, it was telling me the truth, um, and that there was something sacred in this that deserved to be called freedom of conscience, Freedom of conscience being precisely uh, the capacity for loyalty to one's own highest insights despite one's own interests. Um, I think that, that that was a very constitutive uh, idea in the, you know, in the enfranchisement of the citizen and so on. And I think it's a very great shame to, uh, to attempt to pry people loose from the conception of conscience. Mm. Well, and you also, you also talk about, I mean, the, 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 the title um, essay of the book, What Are We Doing Here, um, is about the importance of the humanities and okay. about humanities education. Um, and, uh, you know, to turn a question back on you, the one that you raise, um, what, are they, what are they good for? You ask, what are they good for? And it, is, is part of that then building this individual sense, sense of conscience um, outside perhaps of, um, if, you, if one is not a religious person, if, if you don't have these um, ideologies perhaps that might form moral values or might teach those kinds of values. Um, is, that, is that the role of that kind of education? Is, is part of it developing, helping people develop that sense of conscience? Well, I mean, that might be more finely tuned as a purpose than I would want to suggest for it. But I do think that the wider, the wider people's exposure to what is to be known, the freer they are to choose among the things they know are possible as things that they, predict, they find out where their gifts lie. You know, I think that's one of the things that's been important about traditional education in America, that you take these kids and you show them a world of everything possible, you know, science and, and math on the one hand and, you know, poetry on the other and so on, and they can, they can find their affinities. And people's affinities generally align very closely with their gifts, you know? And so a way of making people productive in the high sense of the word is to, to let them know what a world of options civilization has actually created for them, you know? Um, I think that the knowledge of the self, the knowledge of the core self, what I want, what I love, you know, what I value, that really is, I think, the center of a, of a healthy personality. I don't like to use language like that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that, 
that the, the, you know, the theoretical liberties that we propose for one another lose meaning as we lose sense of ourselves as morally competent individuals with enough experience of what is to be known to make, uh, to make reasonable judgments when circumstances require them. Um, I think that, it, um, that there is very little respect for the general public in this suggestion that they really don't need to, you know, why read Shakespeare when what we need is a machinist, you know, as if machinists don't read Shakespeare. You know, it's very bizarre. Mm. Well, it seems almost like there was at a, a moment just when, you know, uh, institutions that um, allowed for the humanities to actually be liberating, to, it's, you know, public education, public universities that actually made the possibility of a life beyond a, a life of the mind beyond a factory line or, 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 or of service mm -hmm. possible, that, you know, you might be able to, um, you know, that there was mass literacy, the ability to, to, to be educated in this way. And it feels like it was almost a blip now because education now is turning more towards the, 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 um, the need to be productive, the need to keep up, the need to, um, th that, that we've decided, and you, and you, you write about this, that, you know, the, the that, that this automated future that is, is barreling towards us um, is in many ways seen as just this is great progress that we're making here and there hasn't been a, enough pause to consider what are we giving up um, okay. as we move towards becoming these, you know, uh, sort of this kind of brain-based education solely, or, you know, the, the... Can you talk a bit about that? Well, first of all, I think it's very ironic that uh, at, at a time when the wealthy cultures are wealthier than any human societies have ever been before, that we can talk people into, again, this fearful dread of whether or not they will be able to somehow live in the world of the future, you know? Um, the future didn't come out of thin air, it came from a population that was able to produce it, you know? I mean, we've been, if you look at American history, you know, that we, all, we always had, at least in most regions, a strong educational ethic. But after the Second World War, we, uh, we had the GI Bill, which you know, opened education to everyone who'd been in the service. They could go to college for nothing, and uh, which led to a huge expansion of all the universities because so many of them wanted to do exactly that. And they did, and then there's this huge bulge in, in wealth generating economic activity, you know, all sorts of people who are trained to think elegantly uh, make very good engineers, you know, I mean, it's not as if these things were in opposition with each other. And when you look at the consequences of the kind of education that those men sought out, it, it was a huge enhancement of cultural life across the board, you know. There are so many men in America, my generation, who, whose fathers went to college for the first time, and then everything opened for them after that, you know? Um, the idea that there's some opposition between letting people be educated as they choose to be educated in line with their gifts, some opposition between that and any kind of cultural prosperity, however you define it, that's a very, there's no grounds for that. There's no history to confirm that. You um, and on on that point of um, of history, this line um, caught my attention. You say that uh, America is in a state of bewilderness, bewilderness that cries out for good history. Um, can you define what you mean by good history? I mean, you know, history that, for one thing, consults primary sources. <laughs> 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 it's just amazing. If you have read some of the books that are considered the universal correct, you know, the, the touchstone books, you find out that people write about them. Obviously, they haven't even heard good rumors about what these books can do. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we have a problem in the States now that we talk about a lot, which is 
how do you know that what you hear is true mm -hmm. because of the whole fake news and and the fact that the <clears throat> head of state is a little wobbly on that point and so on. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing about it is that, you know, the truth sounds like truth. You know what I mean? You should find, if you're going to talk about what someone said, you should be responsible to the fact that his words are in print. You can know, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the, that the farther you float away from trying to be faithful to what is discoverable and documentable, the less your language begins to sound like truth and the more it begins to sound like fabulism, you know. Um, these great myths are generated in, in the academy as well as anywhere else about the past, whatever, of the culture on the basis of a book that was written on the basis of a book that was written on the basis of a book, and you don't know how far you'd have to go to find somebody actually spending a good many hours in a library. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. very disheartening. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, it's, it's, it's very painful. Um, you know, here in Canada, you know, one thing that, that last year was the 150 years of confederation. And um, it became, I think, initially people, that there was sort of a sense of 150 years of Canada, which, of course, is you know, Canada is much older than 150 years. Right. And so the whole question of who tells Canadian history, what is Canadian history, what is the, you know, how, who, who is absent from these stories, mm -hmm. what is the official narrative, who's been shut out of the official narrative. Um, and I think that it's, it, it becomes a, a, a very painful and hard process to, to have that good, real history, to acknowledge um, how much of our history is, is a degree of myth-making, um, how much it reflects our present desire for some for a nostalgic past or a past that we can only feel pride in, yes. as opposed to a reckoning with a past that um, has many horrific things that we have to contend with exactly. and confront. That's really true, and you know that it's, there's a funny, I don't know what societies are, I don't know what history is, all that sort of thing, but I do know that we tend to drift toward regrettable old proclivities, you know? Uh, uh, I think that, I mean, it's, it's a very valuable lesson if you want to draw a lesson from American history that we are dealing now with ideas and attitudes and, and alignments and so on that we, most of us would have taken an oath had essentially been driven out of the culture, at least embarrassed into silence, you know? Uh, and here they are again, and they are making serious moves, you know? Um, and, you know, people don't recognize them because they have not learned their own history well enough to know that, for whatever reason, our culture has a bias in that direction, mm -hmm. and it always has to be watched. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, you are, um, very um, unsparing in your criticism of you know, the ideologies and the actions of the left and the right in this in this book, and um, even on that idea of uh, you know the amnesia around particular American values, the mm -hmm. um, you you say it's shocking how defenseless the protection of the environment of the poor and even the rights of voters have been shown to be in recent years. No one defends these things as American because the left no more than the right thinks of them as among our core values. So what accounts for that amnesia? Because I think it's not even that distant a history that, um, that there was this, this, this push to expand voting rights. That is a very central part of American history. Yes. And, um, or um, thinking about you know, even concerns conservation has, has roots both on the right and the left. Um, mm. Care for people who are vulnerable um, has a tradition both on the right and the left. So how did both of those sides collectively forget the values that, as you say, have been a very significant part of the American story? Well, you know, I wish I could answer that question sufficiently. Um, I do think that uh, one of the things that people on the left have done, and please, I identify utterly with people on the left lacking any reasonable alternative. <laughs> 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 but one of the things that they have done is uh, create a narrative uh, about the United States as if it invented capitalism, which it certainly did not. It's not hard to see where, you know, 
you can get an annotated bibliography called Capital, a Critique of Political Economy, um, written by a man named Karl Marx. Uh, <laughs> you may have heard of him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but in any case, uh, they, they take the, the cartoon, you know, that I think everybody in the world is familiar with, of the sort of sharp elbows and irrationally bright eyes and pushing toward the, you know, wilderness and so on. Um, that then it says if everything that was humane in the culture as it developed was an imitation of another culture, not intrinsic, not, not the thing that made America great. So we have, you know, that it accounts for a great deal of the fragility of things that are actually our own ideas, our own highly characteristic institutions, you know, uh, and it makes them fragile relative to arguments about restoring what people on that side take to be a, a real America, a pure America, you know. Uh, there were, you know, all sorts of things that were liberalizations of political life or cultural life that happened in New England before they happened anywhere else in the Western world, you know, women being able to inherit uh, property at the deaths of their fathers, which is an innovation, amazing to consider. Um, public education itself was pursued at a much higher level of intensity than it was anywhere else in the West, probably anywhere in the world. Um, the, the list goes on and on, you know, the, the uh, the ban against cruel and unusual punishment goes clear back to 1641 in Massachusetts and uh, was, uh, became law at the time when people were still having their noses chopped off for various kinds of you know, minor infractions and so on in the old world and in the South, the American South, which was much more a pure colony of Britain than, than New England was. Um, but in any case, there are, you know, things like conserving land. The first land to be conserved for public use in America was uh, province, the province lands in the, on the tip of Massachusetts, which have been public land since basically the pilgrims set foot on them, you know? Ideas like that are deeply, imp you know, Im implicit in American culture. They did not come from somewhere else. Um, they are not add-ons to a society that was built on other assumptions. I, I feel like I've, I've been dwelling a lot on, on negative things, so I want to turn this a little bit more towards optimism, um, because there's a great deal of that in, 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 in your writing and in, and in this book. And you work with younger writers, you are on university campuses, you teach. Okay. Um, you even even in moments of despair over this current moment, you seem very optimistic about um, um, the, the the younger generations that you work with. What wh where do you see um, cause for optimism and for hope and these values that are so important? Where do you see them being upheld? Who do you who do you look to as as sort of the beacons of of um, of people who are fighting back against this cynicism and back against this divisiveness? Mm -hmm. One thing that has to be said, you know, uh, is that this present bizarre situation in our government has really, really, really aroused interest in our government, you know? Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of intensification of political life in, at every level, you know? Um, lots of, of some, you know, we have this federal system, you know, that, that allows big important states like California and New York to uh, set their own course in a very large degree, you know, or to resist mightily if anyone tries to prevent them from doing that. Um, the, the, uh, the whole West Coast now is is operating on other principles, shall we say, or operating on principles, perhaps I should say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, it's a very lively, it's a lively community, the United States, you know. All kinds of things go on, all kinds of people are thinking all the time about ways around problems, ways through them. Um, and, and I don't, 
you know, I, if I had to choose a community in whose hands I would feel safe, it would be the United States, you know. After all my years there, I think that almost any question arouses a, a serious desire to do well, and I expect that that will play out in the next few years. Um, I just a couple more questions before we open it up, and um, I wanted to um, return a little uh, to the idea of reflection and to one's relationship with one's own mind and one's own self. And, um, you know, I, 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 I was, again, struck by um, when you were talking earlier about the sense of conscience and how we develop our own set, our own you know, moral compass, how we develop our own set of values. And again, we're at a moment where we are more capable of expressing ourselves, of being heard, of being heard by not just our neighbors, but you know, globally through social media platforms, I mean, all of that. And yet it seems it's harder to find that quiet stillness within ourselves. Um, are you someone who, um, are you a sort of engaged with the social media life? Do you find that it becomes a distraction for you in your writing? Do you feel a benefit to this kind of global, abil this ability to connect globally? Or um, is it not for you? Or is it something that you think we should be careful of in terms of how it changes our relationship with ourselves? It is so not for me that I can't even give advice about it. <laughs> 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 I do think that um, that there are th we have to be careful of marketing always, you know. There's, there, there are images of well-being and there are always people running somewhere or using a huge <laughs> machine that, you know, will make their blood pressure do something, that sort of thing, you know. Um, there is no ideal of the self or of the good life that someone sitting by a window with a book, you know, when, I mean, in, you know, in my own childhood, nothing mattered. I mean, insofar as my childhood produced an agreeable adult life, nothing was more important than the fact that I spent a lot of time by myself with a book. And um, I think that, you know, the encounter with another mind that you make in a book is a fantastic instruction in attentiveness, you know, in the possibility of seeing things otherwise than you would see them. Um, I, I think that, you know, we individually can counter mass pressures, cultural pressures, marketing pressures, by remembering things like the absolute importance of being able to enjoy being alone, being able to enjoy quiet or silence, uh, being able to want to think a thought all the way from beginning to the, the beginning to the end, uh, watching all the time to make sure it is indeed your thought, you know? Mm. Um, I have the last thing I wanted to close on and then I'll um, open it up to the Q&A. Um, it was a line from Gilead uh, when uh, Reverend Ames is watching a young couple um, in front of him and it's a rainy day and they're on their way to church and there's raindrops on the branches. And he's thinking of them as he watches them. And he says, uh, this is an interesting planet. It deserves all the attention you can give it. Um, and I guess the last thing, because I feel like that is a place where you could give advice, is, is how, do we, how do we make sure we don't lose our attention to this interesting planet? <laughs> how, how, do, how do we develop that capacity in ourselves? Um, you know, part of it just comes with training the eye. I think that more people know that, do that than, than realize it. You know, I hear people in this country talk about Banff or, you know, uh, talk about growing up in some rural place uh, or by the coast or whatever, and they have watched it and they know it well, you know. Um, and this is a sort of internal treasure of theirs that they, you know, that this visual thing is a, is a persisting presence in their mind that they can always refer to again. Um, that's looking at the planet, you know? Those, those things are the planet. And then there's also the fact of reading contemporary science, which I do to the limits of my limited ability, you know, but there are magazines, I read, I subscribe to Science News and to Scientific American, 
And they're always talking about the thing farthest, farthest, farthest from any ordinary sense of utility. <laughs> <laughs> and it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's like reading the Psalms or something, you know. Um, I mean, they, one of the really toxic ideas that I think has spread in Western culture, really, is that science is antagonistic to humanism, mm. you know, um, that it will make you, you know, ratchet down your appreciation for what is true or what is beautiful, you know. Uh, I think, you know, you just, you have to learn the dialect of it a little bit, you know. But basically, it's a, an immersion every week, every month, in, in the utterly miraculous circumstance we live in, not talking just about the earth, but the everything we know about, everything that surrounds it and makes it so minuscule by comparison. Yeah. I just had the experience of um, my son uh, was learning about um, the atom at mm -hmm. school, and I just had the experience of witnessing someone understand um, an atom for the first time. Right. And it is, I mean, it is, there, there is wonder and holiness and incredible beauty in, yeah. Amazing. in that. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah.